I've been thinking about the sounds of explosions. Now, I've read a lot of war memoirs, World War II memoirs, and something that comes up again and again and again is that people report that they do not hear the explosion that actually blows them up. If a mortar bomb lands in the next field, they hear a really loud bang, but the mortar bomb that lands so close to them that it blows them off their feet, they don't hear at all, and they're quite mystified by this. Well, I have an explanation for this. Um, I'm not saying that this is the explanation, but a possible explanation is this. Imagine that bomb going off in the next field. That shakes the air, and that shaking air hits the next bit of air, which hits the next bit of air, hits the next bit of air, and a wave of sound travels from that, bu that, that bomb up the canal of your ear, and it vibrates your eardrum, and you hear a very loud noise. But when you're so close to the explosion that the ex expanding gases of the explosion itself hit you, then they will push your eardrum and just hold it there. Your eardrum isn't vibrating backwards and forwards because a shock wave is meeting it. It's the actual moving gas, the actual moving gas that's causing that shock wave that you would hear if it landed in the next field. But this is the gas itself pushing your eardrum that way. And so because your eardrum is not vibrating back and forth, you don't hear boom. You just find yourself lying over there and feeling a bit startled. Now, another issue is the sound of explosions in space. A lot of people will tell you that, of course, that, that sound can't travel in space and that, that therefore you won't hear an explosion. But actually, I think it may be the other way round. You do hear the explosion that almost blows you up in space. Imagine, you're in some sort of um, space fighter craft. We've all seen the sci -fi science fiction movies. You know the sort of thing I mean. It's generally a single-seater, and the pilot, why do they need a pilot? Why couldn't a robot do it, or could it not be done remotely? But anyway, there's always a pilot, because it's more dramatic. Um, the pilot is sitting not in a vacuum, in a spacesuit, but actually in a pressurised cabin. So he's breathing normally. You can see his face, and hear the actor speaking clearly, and he's just breathing air. So some sort of missile or whatever narrowly misses his craft and goes boom just over there bits of the casing from that missile might hit the side of his craft and those would vibrate through the outer skin of his craft and then that vibration would be translated to the air in the craft and so he would hear that so you would hear clatter of bits of shell hitting the outside of your craft but more than that you might actually hear the boom of the explosion itself because if you're so close that the expanding gas with all its inner riot of, of tumult of, of sound presses against the outside of your craft, then that will vibrate the outside of your craft, which will then vibrate the, the air inside your craft, and you'll hear a boom. But I remember an experiment uh, demonstrated to us uh, by my physics teacher at school. He had a jar of bromine gas, which is a dense sort of reddish brown, almost opaque gas, and above it he had another identical jar but this time filled with air. And in between he had a barrier and he removed it. And then over the next few minutes we saw the bromine gas slowly making its way into mingling with the air above it. And after about five minutes you could see that it had made its way about this far up the tube, but getting fainter and fainter as it did. And he said that if you leave it for long enough, eventually the gases become an homogeneous, uh, not quite so dense, brown gas. Well. He then got a second apparently identical setup, but this time there was no air in the top one. The top one was filled with vacuum, if you can fill something with a vacuum, or it wasn't filled with a vacuum, depending on whichever grammar you think is appropriate. Anyway, when he removed the central barrier, immediately, before, faster than the eye could follow, the, the bromine gas just went to the top and filled it, the whole thing, immediately, so it all went a dark browny red colour. And his point was this. There was actually loads of energy in the bromine gas in the first cylinder, but it wasn't able to push that gas to the top of the cylinder because of the air, which also had a lot of energy with the molecules moving around all over the place, resisting it. But when there's no resistance, in fact that gas moves really, really quickly because there's loads of energy in it. You just don't see the energy under normal circumstances. Now in space, an explosion of gas is going to expand and shoot outwards in all directions very, very quickly. So something like a spacecraft encountering that ex expanding gas will only encounter that gas for a very short while as it swooshes past. 
and all the uh, inner turmoil within that gas, uh, all the vibrations, will be encountered extremely quickly. So the sound of an explosion will be very short and very high pitched and this gives me a delicious thought. It makes me think that those last few X and Y wing pilots as they flew back to the rebel base were able to hear the actual explosion in space of the Death Star blowing up behind them and that to them it sounded like this.